My name is Vicki Riskin, and I'm chair of the Board of Trustees, the newly created Board of Trustees of Antioch University in Santa Barbara. Tonight is the first in what we hope will be a series of, event, of events for the benefit and enrichment of the Antioch alumni community and for the community at large. Tonight's focus is on the state of the state. California is faced with the worst economic and social crisis since the Great Depression of 1930. So a quick financial overview. Santa Barbara County is looking at a deficit next fiscal year of $40 million. Santa Barbara City, if I'm correct, it's $12 million, at least nine, okay. Santa Barbara School District, $6 million right now. They did, earlier, they did cuts earlier in the year. The state of California, $20 billion deficit this year. Unemployment in the state is up to 12%. Interestingly enough, it's down nationally to 9.7. So decision makers will be faced with making profoundly difficult choices. Does Santa Barbara County shut down a health clinic or cancel in-home services for the disabled? Does the city of Santa Barbara close a fire station or a park? Does the, the Santa Barbara School District fire teachers shorten the school year and increase the class size? I'm sorry if I'm painting a very negative picture, but that's where we are right now and the list only goes on. There are numerous examples in California during the last six decades of the 20th century of successful bipartisan cooperation to address the great issues of our state. But state and local governments became much more difficult after the passage of Proposition 13 in 1978. I'm one of a minority of Americans who voted against, of Californians who voted against Proposition 13 and who believes that it cast a baleful shadow over our politics until the present day. But I also believe that Proposition 13 is w far too often used as an excuse for not getting things done. Another favorite alibi is the archaic two-thirds rule that California requires for passage of a budget, which dates back to the Depression and for raising taxes, a legacy of Prop 13. Both these requirements existed in 1991 when California suffered a hair-curling recession caused largely by the implosion of the aerospace industry. Uh, after Pete Wilson was elected governor in 1990, but before he took office, he was meeting with the outgoing governor, George Duke Majin, when an aide brought, brought in revenue numbers showing that the state, which was supposed to be running a slight surplus, would instead have a monumental deficit. Wilson, a Republican, realized immediately that dealing with the deficit required a combination of budget cuts, which were anathema to the Democrats, and tax increases, which in his own party, then as now, they, they despised. Wilson enlisted a partner in his bipartisan enterprise. He was Willie Brown. The, the issue is food stamps. During the current recession, the use of food stamps has grown exponentially. There are now some 36 million Americans receiving them. Nearly three million of these recipients are in California. But the bad news for the working poor is that another three million Californians who are eligible to receive them are not receiving them. Now, the principal reason that so many eligible Californians do not receive food stamps is that unnecessary barriers have been erected to the application. One of these barriers is a legal requirement that food stamp applicants be fingerprinted. And it's not just a matter of concern to the working poor. It's estimated that each dollar of food stamps has a multiplier effect of $1.84 in the economy. So if all the 70,000 people or, or so people in Santa Barbara County who are eligible for food stamps actually received them, they'd be receiving $58 million more than they do now, and the effect on the, econo on the county's economy would be $108 million. Our problem begins, obviously, with the state budget, and the budget really uh, matters because it funds a, not only a physical infrastructure, but also a social infrastructure that allows us to develop our, our private economy. And Lou talked about Proposition 13, and, and I'm also not one who, who likes to harp on Proposition 13, but it is a fact that since its passage in 1978, it has completely realigned, in fact, some would say tangled, the systems of government. The fact local. of the matter is that state government's response to Proposition 13 was to take on many of the services that local government used to pay for, specifically schools, social welfare programs, and so on and so forth. The other piece of it was to take what was then a $5 billion surplus and to give it as a bailout to the local uh, governments. And we are living today 
with the fallout from those decisions that were made immediately after the, pro the passage of Proposition 13. And as a result, all of the political power over much of local government now resides in Sacramento. The large number of initiatives that have passed that specifically address the budget. From Proposition 98 to the lottery to any number of other uh, ballot box budgeting things, more and more of the budget has been taken out of the purview of elected officials and put on automatic pilot so that the amount of the budget that can actually uh, be dealt with from year to year is quite small. Our Political districts, in terms of the legislature today, uh, are generally safe Democratic seats or safe Republican seats. And so what you have in Sacramento is very liberal Democrats and very conservative Republicans. And the notion of a political middle or, or moderates has really gone away. And that's why we see this polarization in almost every single issue. The two-thirds vote really works two, two ways. One, it's necessary to pass a budget, but more importantly, it's necessary to pass almost any tax increase. Now, the two-thirds budget vote has been in the Constitution since before the, uh, the Great Depression. It was in there uh, as a way of guarding against uh, FDR liberals in the legislature. But the two-thirds vote for a tax increase has come with Proposition 13. California is one of 16 states that has a two-thirds vote for tax increases, but one of only three uh, that has it for the budget. It's the only state that has it for, for both. Thank you all for being here. I, I wonder how many alums there are in this group. I think this is so fabulous that you're all here. I, I'm honored to be invited um, by the board uh, uh, of trustees, Vicki Riskin and, and the stellar board of trustees. And I'm sitting with three of them, so I'm, it's quite intimidating to be the last on the perch. And but I want to say a word about the importance of an institution like this one, Antioch University, founded in 1852, providing students with knowledge, skills, and habits to be successful in an ever-changing world. I want to start by saying where we were just 12 months ago. On a brink nationally, uh, times are still tough here in the state. We've heard the figures. But I think it's important to remember how far we've come as a nation since that time. The economy was actually grow is actually now growing by 6%. This is nationally whereas last year it was shrinking by 6%. The infusion these billions of dollars into our state uh, saved jobs, rescinded those pink slips that school teachers were getting. The remainder of the Recovery Act funds is making historic investments in areas most in need. And this is, again, still a work in progress. One, being upgrading infrastructure, and second, investing in green technology and the clean energy technology, which is all future directed. Our democracy is resilient. It's messy, as you have seen. It's very messy, but it is doable. And even when it happens in the way that we watch it, at least the, the action is happening. We need to develop a strategy for the long term. And when you were in a state of crisis, this is when you're motivated to do that. That's what a crisis is, isn't it? First of all, we have to return to a um, culture of fiscal discipline and reduce the national debt. Now, we're doing that by spending. So it's a real, that's part of the conflict that you hear in Washington, D.C. We can't afford health care reform because it's putting us more into the deficit. We can't afford not to do the reform because that will break us as well. So this is a challenge. Yes, health care costs are devastating our families, a major reason for personal bankruptcy. It's too expensive for our state. It's too expensive for business. So it is health care as part of the economy. Uh, we, we want an opportunity for every young person, every person who needs retooling because they lost their job, to have a place of access where they can come and get new skills, and get back out there to the workforce, and, and get us going to that. If we don't have the skills to take these jobs, then we will be left behind. But the secret to California's uh, success in the past was always its schools. I, I really believe this is an extraordinary time. I'm not trying to minimize the pain that people are suffering as they've gotten their pink slips, as they've gotten, become laid off. And at the same time, that's, why cha that's where change can come if we keep our resources together, don't lose hope that we can do this, even get our community banks to have the confidence to loan money again to small businesses so that they can continue to hire people. At the end of the day, we have to have discussions like this together so that we can encourage each other in the ways that we can work together to make that happen. So thank you. <laughs>